Well, greetings, brethren. It's good to be with you once again. We are going to continue on from last week in Galatians chapter 6. If you turn your Bibles there, please. Paul about to run out of ink. <laughs> He's got a few more things to say, but we'll pick up the reading there in verse 14 of Galatians chapter 6. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. As for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God." Let's pray. Father, again, we want to thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Spirit. We confess our need, Lord, for Your Spirit in this hour. Uh, I pray for grant liberty and allow this message to go forth to the glory of Your Son. And Lord, You'd help Your people. You would speak the hearts of those who know You not. Lord, may You, as Your own Son said, as He's lifted up, his truth is that you would draw men unto himself. And we ask this for his sake and in his name. Amen. So, yeah, last week we, we looked at this boasting of the Judaizers here in 12 and 13, whom Paul charges as those solely interested in, in, in boasting in the flesh. Very much interested in that. He contrasts them with Himself, strangely enough, and His desire to boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and consequently, Paul establishes that a person's relationship to Jesus' cross is very much expressed in terms of what they seek to boast in. Self or Him. So last week's message was, was mainly dealing with this battle of boasts or this battle between flesh and the cross, your, your boast revealing the most about you. However, we really didn't get to this last part of verse 14. The by which of Paul's statement here. The cross by which, Paul says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And this is very significant to our understanding of the cross. Because the cross is all about death. It's a, it was a cruel instrument where bodies were placed upon it and nailed there to die. And I pointed this out in our last message that you know, the sentiment about the cross in Paul's day is much different than it is in our day. I mean, today we, we throw it on a t-shirt, we hang it on the wall, we wear it on our neck, and maybe some of us here, we even got it tattooed on our bodies. And I mean, it's pretty much become a Christian symbol. But it was nothing close to that in Paul's day. The cross was, it wasn't a shrine. It wasn't some great statement of victory or a good luck charm. It, was a, it wasn't a symbol of peace or of faith. It was a symbol of death and judgment. That's exactly what it was designed for, and that's exactly what got carried out upon it. Death. Of course, that was a great stumbling block to the Jews. And the very same thing that was a stumbling block to the Jews was folly to Gentiles or Greeks because who ever heard of a man being crucified to a tree as a Messiah? I mean, what kind of leader is that? What kind of conqueror? What kind of deliverer is somebody who's... I mean, in fact, that sounds just the opposite, right? It sounds like certain defeat. The man died. How, how is he to deliver? And so that was the great stumbling block to the Jews. In fact, it, was, it sounded like a curse because their own law taught them that cursed was everyone, not just some, but everyone who was hanged on a tree. Jesus would have been included in that everyone. They knew that. So what's, what's the great boast in the cross then? Well, we answered some of that last week. Um, and really, it's an answer that's impossible 
to give an exhaustible answer to because there's a, it's a question you can't really exhaust because there's so much in the cross. There's so much depth, so much spiritual reality expressed and realized in the cross, we just don't have time to do it in one message. But let's just look at what Paul refers to here, or even two messages. What, what Paul refers to here in the context of his statement. I mean, he does couch, couch his boasting here in, in, in some spiritual reality, some specific spiritual realities. The, this boasting that Paul speaks of is one of death and life. Death to self and this creation, this new creation he speaks of. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, this, this death. Let's look further at this death expressed in verse 14. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul is teaching us here that Jesus' death, unlike any other death, it, it, it's profoundly, it profoundly produced not just the death itself, but a multiplicity of deaths. In fact, what we have here is a trifecta of death. This verse sets forth crucifixion not just once, but three times. Christ's crucifixion, Paul's crucifixion, and the world's crucifixion. And this is true of every single Christian. Obviously, there was only one cross that Christ bore, and Jesus only died once on that cross. But through the instrumentality of faith in Christ, Paul is teaching us that we are joined to Jesus, united with Him in such a way that everything Jesus accomplished and experienced on that cross is applied and we actually experience it spiritually ourselves. This is why it's so important that we get the cross right. Because the ramifications of it on, the, on gospel doctrine and on the gospel message is immense. See, we have to understand the cross does far more than simply cancel our record of debt that stood against us. It did that for sure. It does more than just wipe away our sin and make us guilt-free and forgiven sinners. It does more than satisfy the demands of God's righteous holy law as Jesus became that unblemished lamb crucified on that tree, offered up on our behalf, the righteous for the unrighteous, making peace by the blood of His cross. All those things are very true and very precious and very priceless. But that's not the totality of the cross of Christ. And if you make that the totality of the cross of Christ, you misrepresent Jesus and His whole mission and purpose. And I submit to you, that's exactly what's happened in our own day. We've turned the cross into an absolver of sin and then this final trump card to be played at the judgment seat irrespective of how we live our lives. This fire escape, if you will. That, that, and that's it. And such an understanding of the Gospel completely neuters it from the life-changing power that it provides. That frankly, the New Testament has very much to say about. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that the death that took place on Calvary's cross that, saw, that, that, that cost my Savior's blood. That death, Paul says, that death produced a twofold death in me. I died there with Christ, and it was there also that the world was crucified to me. The world was made dead to me. And Scripture affirms these two realities in numerous places. Romans 6 2, you don't have to turn there, but. How can we who are dead to sin still live in it? Paul asks. Do you not know that all of us, Christians, all of us, who have been baptized into Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Paul saying we've been united with Christ in His death. You, believer, united with Him in death. Colossians 2.20 If with Christ you died, which you have if you're a Christian, 
If you die to the elemental spirits of this world, there's a death to this world that occurs when we come to faith in Christ. Colossians 3.3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul, summing up the whole matter, says in, 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 in Romans 6.11, so you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Alive to God in Christ Jesus. That, that mindset is a very important mindset to possess and lay hold of as a Christian. Christian, you're not the product of defeat. You're not. You end up hearing that in a lot of places. Jesus didn't die to simply pay the price for you as a criminal and leave you a criminal. Enslaved to this world and yourself. He died to turn you from being a criminal into a holy pursuer of righteousness. Endure of righteousness. And brother, I'm just afraid. So much, so much failure in the lives of Christians is due to not thinking properly about our relationship to sin. Paul says you must consider yourself. This is crucial. You must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That is, you have to take it upon yourself to foster a certain mindset and attitude toward sin and toward God. You have to equip your mind in a certain way if you're desiring a certain kind of result. If you don't consider, if you don't think, if you don't remind yourself, hey self, I'm actually dead to sin. That's what, that's what the Bible says. That's what Scripture tells me. I'm no longer a slave to this thing like I used to be. Christ's cross holds forth sin-breaking power that enables me to say no to sin. It does. Fool that I am. I, 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 I think the reason I've been falling into this sin and giving place to it in my life because I haven't been thinking right about it. I need to align my thinking with Scripture God actually does provide grace to overcome sin and not be ruled by it. Brethren, if we don't think biblically about sin, we will no doubt have, it, it will no doubt have a very adverse effect and have adverse consequences on our lives and how we live them out in our battle against sin. We're going to always be on the defeated side of it. You know, so often, you know, you hear, hear some Christians aren't perfect. Well, that's ob obviously, that's, that's true. But how, how do you receive that? What do you think when you hear that? I mean, how do you process that state, statement of truth? Because it is true. None of us here believe in sinless perfection. We, uh, and that's one of the reasons we just had the Lord's table, right? Be reminded that in all our falling short and all our failures, we have a Savior who paid it all. All to Him we owe. Who, who bore, has bore all our sorrow, all our shame. Who is our justification. Not ourselves, for sure. But Christians aren't perfect. What, that does not equate to Christians still being bound in their sin. It certainly does not erase the scriptural declaration that Christians are dead to sin and alive to God. And the Christian life is fraught with all kinds of ups and downs that we've already talked about this morning. Some victories and defeats and seasons of subduing the flesh with the joy of God and the Holy Spirit's aid and seasons of re just rejoicing in the Lord's help and, and seasons of God just proving His grace to be sufficient when the times have gotten so difficult and hard and hard to endure, but His grace has enabled us to continue to endure. That's a true reality. But there's also breakdowns in our life of faith. Just face it, it's true. Failures to trust our God. Giving way to temptations at times. Letting our tongues get ahead of our own minds and learning the hard lessons that we are still capable of, sins we're still capable of. And Brethren, the Christian life is one of having to pick ourselves up and just keep trekking. Keep trekking up the hills of difficulty. Keep pressing through the, the dungeons of despair. Life as, as a Christian is, is real warfare. One that leaves battle wounds, one, yet one that makes you more and more resilient as you c continue on in battles. I mean, are you a Christian? If you're a Christian here, do you feel tested as we heard in the first hour? You feel that? Do you feel the test? Or is that foreign to you? 
If the idea of being tested is foreign to you, I'd be very concerned about your profession of faith. See, the, the cross is so central to all of this. How we relate to the cross and process it and what was actually accomplished there on the cross, that has great ramifications in how we go about living our daily lives and how we think about ourselves in this world and the world to come. The cross should remind us that Jesus' crucifixion, brethren, it releases a transferable power into our own lives. It does. His crucifixion produces our own crucifixion. That's what Paul's saying right here. I'm dead to the world. The dead world's dead to me. The cross did that. Not, not me. That's the power of the cross in my life. Jesus brought that into my life through His death. My own death. That's why Paul says in chapter, chapter, four, verse 20, I mean, chapter 5, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus are saying the same thing have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is what cross application produces in God's children. This is what Paul's saying here. The world, the world which held so much sway upon my mind and my life. And you know that if you're a Christian, what you were before God saved you, how much sway the world had upon you, through the cross, it's now accounted dead to me. Gone. Dead. I, it's been crucified to me. It, along with all my sins, have been nailed to the tree. My, my, I'm crucified to my, the carnal, worldly lifestyle that I led. I, I'm crucified to that. Now, I, I was so enslaved to it, it's gone. It's dead. I, I was so far, I was so removed from God, so far apart from God, so distant from Him. It's dead. The life I was living, a life that was dominated by self-seeking desires, my, my life of, of 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 partying and drinking days, it's dead. I'm, I'm crucified to that. I'm crucified to an immoral, godless lifestyle of pursuing wickedness. I, I'm crucified to a self-righteous disposition that thought I, I was better than other people that ruled over my life. Brethren, if that's true, then you have reason to boast because the cross did that. You didn't do it. The cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul's boasting. Paul, Paul's use of, of the world here, I mean, he's clearly speaking of the spiritual realm. It's not speaking of the physical one. It's, it's, it's really a reference to the present evil age that he mentions back there in chapter 1, verse 4. It is, that is the age of this flesh. The, the age of sin and death. The, the, the age of old covenant law. The, the age of the first Adam. All, all that balled up, balled up into one. Through the cross, I, I have, I've been taken out of that age and placed into this new age of the Spirit. Brethren, when Jesus uttered those words on the cross, it is finished. You realize He wasn't just referring to everything being accomplished necessary to satisfy God's justice. That wasn't it. He was speaking about the whole package of redemption. He was equally speaking about fully securing everything necessary to fully usher in this new age, this age of the Spirit. Paul is speaking in eschatological terms here. We, we tend to think of eschatology, and, and, you know, which is the study of you know, last things or the end times. Theology of the end times. We tend to only think of those in future terms only, right? We're, you know, what's going to happen after we die? You know, when's Jesus coming back? We talk about his return. You know, who's the beast, the two witnesses? You know, what do we, what about, you know, who's the antichrist? And, you know, all these kind of things. The millennium, what is it and when is it? And, you know, are you post trib or pre trib or, you know, why, you know, why is John MacArthur still believing the rapture when it's nowhere in scripture? You know, we talk about those kind of things and we're talking about eschatology. And, brethren, the truth of the matter is we're in the last days right now we're in the eschatological age that began at pentecost and this is where paul is is coming from and where he, what he's getting at here the old age the age under the first adam paul is saying it's dead to me it's it's history it's over 
Because of the arrival and accomplishments of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, that age is over. Paul's basically reasserting here in verse 14 and 15 what he already said in Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I've died to the world in Christ and, and, and now I live this in this age of the Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Therefore, circumcision, uncircumcision, it, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters now is a new creation, Paul says. Being made New through the atoning work of Jesus. In fact, those are Paul's very next words. Verse 15, For neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. Four. It's continuing here. This is our signal for ex explanation. Paul's now about to elaborate on what he just stated in verse 15 about the cross and boasting in it and its relationship, his new relationship to the world. Paul, why are you boasting in the cross? And why, why has the world been crucified to you and you to the world? And Because the cross has not only produced death, it's also the gateway to life. That's why. Four, here's why. Neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. That, that's really the only thing that counts, Paul's saying. Keep in mind, Paul would have been circumcised since the eighth day he was born. By law, by God's law, as a righteous act of obedience. Paul saying, it counts for nothing. <laughs> how I wish we could be gripped, better gripped with just how radical a statement this is by Paul. You just roll back... the. You roll, you roll back the clock to any time before Jesus' death. And this is pure heresy. Absolutely. Brethren, the Jews hearing this, this is equivalent to me standing up here and saying, well, you know, me, uh, as of today, you know, us, us others, elders, we got together, we decided, you know what, we're not going to require people to believe in Jesus alone to be, a part, to be members of the church. Now we're going to open this thing up a little bit, you know. You know, you know I think that all faiths honor God, and you know, therefore, it's, it's fine to believe whatever. We're just going to open this up to everybody. And uh, I mean, that's preposterous, right? That's a complete denial of Christ and His Gospel. You guys would run me out the door faster than you could cry, heretic. This is what Paul was facing. You can say, but, but there was scriptural warrant for what Paul was teaching. Yes, but they were all blind to it. Totally blind. This was a mystery shrouded. They thoroughly thought Paul was a heretical, law-breaking rebel worthy of death. Paul just boldly and unashamedly asserts here circumcision contains no spiritual significance at all. I wish I could have been there to see it. I, <laughs> this is such an offensive uh, suggestion. I mean, let's get real. Uh, there's no authority to suggest a change in circumcision even take place. Right? I mean, obviously there was by Paul saying it right here, but not recognized by the Jews. And, and Paul's not saying that it never mattered. It most certainly did when he was born. Circumcision did matter under the Old Covenant. But now you see the issue is it's gone. It's died. It's in the past. We've entered into a new age. This new creation age. That's what this is all about. And that's why it was so strongly rejected. New according to who? Well, Jesus and His apostles. With the coming of Jesus and His death, burial, and resurrection, a new age has dawned and with it new creation power. And so Paul can look at the Jews and say, your circumcision, it's really no longer valid. It doesn't really matter. And you can look over here at the Gentiles and say, you know, it doesn't really matter. You don't need this mark. You don't need to be circumcised. It, it, it was a symbol that served its purpose in its day. It was very important. Very, very important. 
in its day, in its time, in its realm. That realm's over. Which, you know, this, <laughs> I read this and it raises this question. Maybe I'm, I'm not alone here, but what, what would you expect Paul to say here? For neither circumcision or uncircumcision means or counts for anything, but but what? Maybe I'm the only one thinking. <laughs> but what? What would you expect Paul to say here? But a circumcised heart, right? Or maybe even in keeping with this letter, but faith. And that's what he's emphasized this whole time. I mean, this, but to me, this has seemed like the golden moment for mentioning spiritual circumcision. I mean, Paul, if there was ever a time, this is it, my friend. Brother, this is it. Why, why didn't you say it, Paul? This is on my list of uh, when we get to eternity. Paul, I gotta come. you got a minute I want to talk to you. <laughs> list of questions. But I mean, he, asp- he asserts spiritual circumcision very clearly in other passages. One of which is in Romans. We'll look at that in a minute. But, but he tells the Colossians, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He, he, you, you brethren, you Christian, you have a spiritual circumcision that's taken place within you. That's what Paul's saying. But, but I do think Paul uses new creation here because he's seeking to emphasize the life of the Spirit in this new era. Paul, Paul's referring to regeneration here. Yes, spiritual circumcision carries that same idea, but probably not as clearly, Paul feels, as needs to be made to these Galatians. The cross and faith in the cross and the one who hung there is the source of power that creates a new creation. This is the glory of the Gospel, brethren. This is Christianity through and through. As spirit and dwelt people, this is what we are. The new birth. Being born again. A product of the Spirit of God in this new eschatological age of the Spirit. And you know what? In this new age, God doesn't just dwell with men here on earth. He dwells with men inwardly. That's the difference. He takes it up a notch and comes within us. The new creation is a creation of a new habitation. God inhabiting the bodies of believers and making them holy temples. This is Christianity 101. What really matters is a new creation. Forget about everything else you think that matters pertaining to Christianity. What matters is a new creation. Are you a new creation? This is the most important question you have to face yourself today. Am I a new creation? Everything else is secondary. Am I I a new creation? To not be a new creation is to not be a Christian. That's very much the teaching of our New Testament. If you just turn back four or five pages in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I mean, here it is on point. Starting in verse 16, Paul says, from now on, from now, meaning this this new age of the Spirit. In verse 15, Paul's Paul's marker is is the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, You know, when we're talking about the death and resurrection of Christ and Pentecost, we're talking about events, cascading events of within 50 days. Essentially, we're talking about the same thing. All of those represent the, the new eschatological age of the church. From now on, Paul says, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Circumcision, no. Uncircumcision, no. Uh, Jews, Greeks, no. Slave, free, none of that. None of that enters the equation. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him no longer. Paul's saying, I just, just like you, regarded Jesus in very worldly, fleshly ways. But, but the revelation of the cross, oh, and His resurrection, it, it changed everything. It changed my whole life. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a Christian, 
If anyone's in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. The old passes away, has passed away, and behold, new has come. All this is from who? God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. If anyone is in Christ, what's true about them? What's the Bible say? They're a new creation. They didn't get a new paint job. They didn't slap on some religious materials. They didn't get a new haircut and change their clothes and start wearing a, a, a denim dress that goes, flows down to the floor. I'm not saying anything against dresses. But it, it, it isn't externals. Something internal has to happen. A new happening. A new creation that God alone does. That's what Paul is setting forth here. It's radical to their minds. Everything about their life was externals. Really, everything that's new <laughs> is the opposite of the old. In fact, all those things and more that Jonathan brought out last week in his message, all those are the workings of new creation. They're all the result of, of lifting us out of this realm of absolute darkness and placing us in this new realm of light where everything's new. And we can see that it's new. When that happens, brother, everything changes. You go from death to life. You go from lost to found. You go from the enemy of God to the friend of God. You go from being blind to suddenly having sight. You go from being deaf to not being able to hear to suddenly being able to hear. You go from a callous, hardened heart to a circumcised, soft heart that's responsive to God. You go from a slave of sin to a slave of righteousness. You go from impoverished state of into an impoverished state to riches, to being rich and being made rich, spiritually speaking. You, you enter into all these realities and more as you enter into this new creation, which as it awaits the second coming of Jesus Christ is referred to by theologians as an already not yet realm. That is, we've already entered into this new age, but we haven't realized all the fullness of it, right? The completeness of it. We haven't seen it in all in its perfect state. That is yet to come true. But as a Christian, you've already entered this thing. It has everything to do with the cross. Everything to do with the cross. And that gives Christians every reason to boast in and glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me read a couple of Scriptures here. Romans, you don't have to turn to it, but Romans 6. Beginning in verse 4, we were buried therefore with Him by baptism unto death. In order that. Paul likes to use that statement. In order that. For this very reason. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. New creation life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Verse 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought forth from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. That is a true statement for Christians. Since you're not under law, but under grace. Notice the grace is not to go out in freedom to have sin. It's a grace that is designed in such a way that sin can't have dominion over you. Or Paul could have said, since not that you're under grace, but since you're now a new creation. Could have said that as well. Brethren, that doesn't mean that we, we, still have, we, we, we no longer have sin to deal with. We don't have any issues with sin. It doesn't cause us any problems anymore. It's no concern to us. It simply means that sin will not have... It's the promise. Brethren, if you're struggling with sin, take this to God. This is a promise. Sin will have no dominion over you. 
That's what God says. His word's true. This simply means that's true. And it's true because our relationship to sin has changed coming to Christ. This, this, this realm of sin and law, and, and it can no longer condemn us because we're in Christ. And because we've been crucified with Christ, death itself has lost its sting upon us. Death is an entrance into the glory. A death, death, is, death is an entrance into the fullness of this realm. Romans 8, 3 says, for, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and force, and He condemned sin in the flesh. In order that. Here it is. Why did He do all that? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And what is that? We've been talking about it. Love. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The, the new creation. The new creation walks according to the Spirit. Romans 8.10 But if Christ is in you, He's in those that are this new creation. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, we established that in Romans 6, if the Spirit of life uh, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Yes, you still got this dead, you still got this fleshly thing, but it's, it's dead. It can't overpower you. It can't. Well, you have a new principle, a new life that dwells within you, Christian, that can enable you to walk in righteousness. And truth, that's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is getting at. We're no longer bound to the realm of sin and flesh and the law. We've been set free from that and placed in the realm of the Spirit through the resurrection power of Jesus. And my friend, that's Christianity. Making dead sinners <laughs> alive through, the, through this new creative work that God does. Titus 3 Verse 5, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's not it at all. Anything to do with you. But according to His own mercy. There it is. That's the Gospel. His mercy. By the washing of regeneration. There's our word. New creation. And renewal of the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life this is what the new creation brings to the table peter says in first peter 1 verse 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ i love this passage according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again what's mercy do it brings life it, it makes a new creation he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's the not yet. Who by God's power, God's new creation power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. I mean, Paul or Peter just greatly captures this, this being birthed into the eschatological age of the Spirit, this, this already not yet age of the Christian united to Jesus Christ in His death and in His life, His resurrection life. And who's the active, empowering agent here? God. He's, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, He says. To this everlasting, untarnished, unfading inheritance, brethren. That's what's true. It's real. It's there right now and it's waiting for you. That's going to come to full fruition in the last time, Peter says. When even heaven and earth will be new. And in this in-between time, this already not yet time, God has given us His Spirit as a guarantee is a pledge. Almost like, like, like an engagement ring. This is yours. This is, this is happening. 
God's promised us an inheritance. And when this thing comes full circle, you're going to have a new body. You're going to worship me on a new earth. There's going to be nothing between you and I. Full exposure. It's going to be absolutely glorious. All this old is going to be really old. It's going to be in total history. Nothing to weigh you down. Nothing to stand between you and I. No need for repentance. No need for faith because you and I are going to be right here together forever. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that that blessing's coming, brethren. Whatever tastes we have, whatever glories we absorb and see in the Scriptures, that is the tip of the iceberg. Well, Paul's, Paul's ending this letter on, on this most important note. At the end of the day, you have men here that are glorying and boasting in mere external rights and customs and regulations that completely miss the mark. They don't matter. The, the, those things all belong to the, to the realm of sin and flesh and law. What really matters is a new life. Do you have it? Are you birthed from above? Have you been made a new creature in Christ Jesus? And how does one know that? Well, he knows it by how the new life expresses itself which Paul has spent the last two chapters discussing. He knows it by... He's one who endeavors to walk by the Spirit, to be in step with the Spirit, to, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, who, who makes it their, their, daily, their daily aim to, to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. They're, they're the one who's endeavoring to sow to the Spirit and to love their neighbor as themselves. Those are the manifest marks of new creation. You've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you have, then there's an old you. There's an old you. Which is no longer what you are. And you should be able to identify that old you. Now, perhaps you can't so easily identify when the new you became a new creation. That's true for some. But you should be able to identify those things that speak to being a new creation, right? And if you have such brethren, rejoice and be exceeding glad because flesh and blood did not give that to you. It didn't. In fact, that's why Christians boast in the cross of Jesus Christ because the cross of Jesus Christ is responsible for all of it. Just think about the greatness of the contrast here, brethren. What, what you have is men boasting in foreskins versus people boasting in the Creator of the universe. That's incredible. And it speaks to man's great depravity. Just the, the foolishness of human, fallen human beings. Well, quickly, Paul further adds in verse 16, and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, if this is your life, and this is your boasting, if you by God's grace live a crucified life and bear the marks of new creation, then you, my friend, are a recipient of peace and mercy. And in all actuality, you are the true Israel of God. And what a shot that is at the Judaizers. The Jews were all about the peace of God, the shalom of God. I mean, that was distinctly something Jewish. That rested upon Jewish people only. Uh, Paul's saying, nope. God's peace is upon the boasters of Jesus Christ who've been born again and live out their lives in this newness of life that comes through the Spirit of the living God. They're not those seeking to obtain God's favor by their doing. They're those resting in the mercy granted them 
in Christ Jesus and have been made worshipers of Him as a result. And Paul, Paul affirms this in his other writings. I said I was going to read Romans 3. Romans 3, 28 and 29. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Philippians 3.3 3, For we are the circumcision. Who? Who worship by the Spirit of God. That's the true circumcision. And we glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. I love that statement. The true boasters have no confidence in the flesh or themselves. And I ask you, where is your confidence? Where is it? I know in recent messages I've emphasized the doing of good, and rightly so. But if you're one who finds their confidence, and I even say this to Christians, if you're one who, who finds your, your confidence seem to you know, kind of almost anchored in your doing good, then you're likely going to be someone that, that is constantly struggling with assurance and a lack of, of a sense of peace. See, real peace is had by those whose, whose confidence is solely placed in the crucified one. And not themselves. Now obviously, if you live a life that's void of, of new creation, you, you ought to have no assurance. You shouldn't. And you should have no peace. But sadly, there are those who have false peace. And some of you need to hear that. But there are others of you that, who constantly struggle with assurance and, and uncertainties, who, who truly are holding on to Christ by faith. And our new cre uh, creations in Christ Jesus, but you're so feeling oriented. A and you, you tend to elevate the horrible nature of your sin uh, above the power of the cross. And, and because you do that, you know so little joy in the Christian life. You know, someone once said, don't belittle the cross by making your sins bigger than the cross. Now, that's, not a, that's not a statement suggesting we make light of our sin at all. It's just an acknowledgement that Christians are very good at condemning themselves. Brethren, bring your sins to the cross and leave them there. Leave them there. That's what it's for. Including any kind of twisted religious pride that would suggest my sin to be a greater problem than the cross's ability to solve it. Romans 5.20 is very clear that God's grace is greater than, than all our sin, actually. This is certainly true for those who are boasters in Christ, who crucify the flesh and endeavor to walk in this newness of life that they've been gifted with from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. We sing it, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Amen to that. So in closing, Paul's glory in the cross, glor he glories in the cross rather because the cross is the gateway to true and everlasting union with the living God. It's the place of crucifixion. It's the place where new life is made possible. Where all the old dies and vanishes and all that's made new, just, it just, it's just the beginning, brother. The beginning of this new creation, it just gets richer and fuller and more and more glorious. And Christian, He's done all that for you. <laughs> he has. He's brought you into all this glorious newness, not just for you to just consume it upon yourself. He's done it so that you might impact those around you who don't have it. That's, that's the whole goal here. That the, the newness that He's instilled in you would impact this lost and dying world. 
In fact, we were talking about trials earlier. I don't remember if it was John or even thinking through James' message. It's like, I wonder sometimes if, if we don't invite our, some trials in our own life because of our failure to express the newness that God's deposited in us. And you know what? If God's deposited newness in you, He has full intentions for that to be spread abroad. And if you won't do it, Guess what? He'll bring trials. So in that trial and you're suffering, people are looking on it and seeing, wow, they're still trusting God. God will bring trials to expose the newness of life in you. So this, this is God's very, this is the design. I mean, Paul's boasting wasn't just kept to himself. He was out proclaiming this. He was Everybody he ran into, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He'll set you free. He'll deliver you from this realm of darkness and, and sin and brokenness. And He'll give you this new life. He'll give you purpose. And Paul was ever about spreading that and sharing that and living that and out in his life before others. And we see the impact of it. So brethren, help us. God, help us to, to be indeed light in this world and for this newness of life to shine forth from our lives. Father, whatever way there's hindrances to that, we pray, remove them. And Lord, we want to be what You've called us to be. We want to be light into this world. We want to be the salt of the world, of this earth. And Father, we thank You for such a glorious cross. Lord, make us boasters of it. Help us, Lord. To, help us to not be deceived. Help us not to, to be distracted away from the most central thing in the universe. And it's the cross of Your Son. Lord, thank You for having mercy upon us. Lord, save in our midst. Lord, please make others to see the sufficiency of Jesus, cross, Jesus Christ's cross. Lord, to, car to carry away all their sin. And Lord, everything else here on earth is just fool's gold that they're chasing that cannot satisfy. And yet, Lord, You hold out everything that satisfies, truly satisfies human beings. Lord, please Please bring that to those outside of Christ today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.